When we talk about um, latent viruses, this is what we're talking about. Yet the guy on the top is a quiet little white blood cell hanging out doing nothing because no one's asked it. It doesn't have a job yet. If it becomes activated, it's because something floated into the system, some antigen, some bug that it's supposed to respond to. And in our systems, we have hundreds of millions of these little quiet cells and each individual cell only knows it's one little job. Yeah, this one's for Epstein-Barr and that one's for staph and that one over there is for some other bug. If that bug comes in the system, then that cell is the one that gets to activate. And then if it has hidden inside it in its DNA, like over there, it has hidden inside it this little piece of virus fragment sitting in that DNA, that, that cell is turned on to make all of its stuff it knows how to make. It got activated. It's going to make cytokines. It's going to make going to make uh, interleukin-2, it's going to make this, that, and everything. And oh, by the way, it's going to make that sneaky little virus that was tucked into its DNA, too. And that's what happens, is that, the, that these latent infections just sit around doing nothing until that cell's activated, and then boom, they, they start making virus stuff. Retroviruses are funny because we're just chock full of them. We have little bits and pieces of retrovirus all in our DNA that we're talk about evolution, our great, 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 great grandfathers got infected with some little piece of something that maybe have jumped from a mouse back then. But it's not a whole virus. They have just little bits and pieces of bust up pieces of retrovirus tucked in the DNA. We think it's an important part of the way we evolved, that we borrow DNA from other species this way and we transfer things around. The viruses carried little pieces of, uh, of information into the genome back then and some of it was bad and that didn't work out and some of it was good and it, and it carried on or it was neutral and it carried on. But there are some retroviruses that can be carried generation to generation as whole and complete viruses tucked into the DNA or rather enough DNA to make a whole and complete virus when it's, when it's turned on. And this is one of those retroviruses. It can be transferred generation to generation or what's called vertical transmission mother or father to child through the DNA. So um, we don't know if this 3 or 4% of background is just people who have vertical transmission or if there's some way that you can infect people back and forth in life. We don't know that at all, okay? But we do know that this virus is one of the ones that's vertically transmitted. We know that from the mouse data. So it can be transmitted vertically. So if you have children... Yeah, so the question is, if you have children, do your children necessarily have it? And the answer is maybe yes or maybe not. First off, there's two parents, not one, and each only give half the DNA up, right? So in any given child, there's only one chance in four you can pass on any particular piece of DNA on a good day. So, so uh, you don't worry too much about kids flat out that way. Then you say, and oh, by the way, in their life, they have to come across the thing that activated the virus and turn this whole mess on. And so there's a whole lot of reasons not to get all worried about. I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't happen to your children. Of course, it, it's conceivable. But what's exciting right now is we're getting this. We're getting the, the understanding it. And we'll probably, with the knock on wood, that we will be to the position where we're actually intervening effectively before it becomes um, a bigger worry. But... Um, Anyway, I don't know about kids, but I'm just saying it is a vertically transmitted virus. We don't know if it's sexually transmitted. I will say that um, H you know, there are sexually transmitted retroviruses. We know HIV is obviously a sexually transmitted retrovirus. Um, but there's no... You'd think in 25 years we would have seen massive numbers of, of spousal pairs, and we have not. You occasionally do. I mean, occasionally you do see a spousal pair. It happens. But almost always those people both had some acute infection at the same time at the onset. And, and it's really unclear if um, it's a transmission between the two of them or if they had some other thing happen that kicked off the whole, the whole thing. And you see household um, chronic fatigue. I mean, I do see mother, daughter, father, daughter, father, son, whatever. I've seen it. But in my clinical practice in 25 years or so, it's not very common. It does, doesn't happen a lot. So, the next slide. This virus is not HIV. A lot of people panicked when they heard this. This virus is really not HIV. It's in the same family, but it's a distant, distant cousin. Very, very distant. And it's not infecting or affecting the same cells. So it's not doing the same immunologic ding 
that HIV does, okay? There are also other retroviruses that don't do anything that we know about. There's a virus called HTLV2 that, that I uh, have studied myself in the past and many others have, and it's just sitting around doing nothing. It's real, it, it's vertically transmitted, um, it even replicates, and it doesn't cause much in the way of illness. So, so um, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, just because you find a retrovirus, it's definitely the, the deal, and not every retrovirus is, is big and bad and ugly. There's another HTL virus called HTLV1 that's vertically transmitted and does cause an illness, and it causes a neurologic illness. So, um, yeah, different bugs, different things. HIV is a retrovirus, and there's at least 20 or more drugs directed at HIV. So will those drugs work to control this virus? So that is definitely the big question of the day. And the first thing to say is some of them probably will. Um, and the second thing to say is, but not all of them, you couldn't just pick a random one and try it. But this was to show you going from mouse to people, that uh, basically it started out way up there as a mouse thing. M mice learned to live with it. They have, don't have the receptor that allows this virus to, to become a big bad deal. So that mice just sit around, you know, for generations and generations of mice being a reservoir of virus, but not actually getting sick from the virus. Um, but then... Um, they, they virus shifted and it became capable of jumping from species to, to humans. So this was the study. They had in their freezer samples from people that weren't from their cohorts. So these were not just Reno samples. These were samples from, from Florida, from uh, California, from uh, North Carolina, and other places. Everyone in their repository had a chronic fatigue diagnosis. The mean age was uh, 55 and there was two-thirds women and they had this large control sample. So they looked, and they looked at these patients in a, of 101 patients, and they looked at the DNA, the sequences of the virus in the DNA. It's a really sophisticated way to look. And um, this is the, what they found was 67%, and 3.75% of the 320 controls. Now, of the negatives, these 33 negatives, they went on and looked in other ways, and they found 19 of those had antibody in their plasma, so that was more than half of those negatives. But this was the big number. 30 of the negatives had virus they could identify by taking the serum from those cells, a serum from the uh, plasma, and infecting a cell line, and then growing the virus in that cell line. So they could transfer from the plasma virus to the cell line. Now that has a lot of implications, and it's certainly the reason why, in part, the CDC, the NIH, and others that really care about the blood industry are looking lo long and hard at this. They found the virus, the transmissible virus, in the plasma, and they were able to infect cell lines. So it suggests there's an infective component, at least in the, in the blood. Um, and then there were other ways. So they worked out that they were able to find 99 of the 101 patients in that way. Now, think about that for a minute. We define an illness by a bunch of symptoms. Now, I'll say Dr. Peterson is a really fine doctor, and I'm quite certain that he's not misdiagnosing chronic fatigue syndrome. He's really splendid. So it could be that he has a really clean, tight population of folks in his freezer. But I would say I think I'm pretty damn good. And, uh, <laughs> and I think if I pulled 100 people out of my freezer, there might be a little a couple of MSs in there or something else that evolved down the line. I mean, I'm not sure. But it's pretty impressive that of 101... CFS people defined by a clinical case definition or a research case definition, they found 99 with virus. And if this is the case, um, that's pretty, pretty exciting. I mean, that's pretty impressive. And oh, by the way, we have a biomarker. Not a small deal. <laughs> a biomarker, the virus itself. No better biomarker than, 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 than something that's clearly tightly associated with an illness.